Hello everyone, welcome along to Live On Air this Sunday evening, Easter 2016. Uh, it's great to be with you again, and tonight we're going to look at a fascinating topic of how to watch a movie. And uh, sitting next to me is Lorinda Erasmus, but our guest presenter um, is sort of far afield over in uh, Albany. <laughs> That's about, what, <laughs> eight miles away from here. Um, it's yep. Elise McAdam, and Elise, uh, I'd like you to just say a few words about yourself, and then we'll come back and ask Lorinda. Well, I think I am possibly the most famous movie watcher in my family. Uh, very well renowned for um, ruining everyone's cinematic experience by pointing out the fact that our emotions are being manipulated by that particular camera angle or that particular lighting. And they all scream, Mom, stop it. So um, I'm going to hopefully give you a few insights like I give to my family. Well, that, that would be absolutely fabulous. But you're, uh, you teach media studies and English, I think, at... Yes, uh, at Birkenhead, Birkenhead College. Birkenhead College, yeah. Yes. So you, you've got a, a huge database, I guess, that you work with, with both uh, students that have done courses in media studies and, and this kind of memory bank of movies in your head. Exactly, yes, yes. I, I probably watch far more movies and um, study far more movies than I actually teach, just because the more you're exposed to it, the more you actually realise what the tricks and the tips are that you can pass on to people to make them more savvy consumers of media and not just puppets that are being manipulated by somebody else pulling the string. That's fantastic. What a great introduction. Thank you, Elise. And Lorinda, would you like to tell us a few words about yourself? Thanks. Yes, um, I'm an absolute foodie. So a few years ago when I went vegan, I couldn't find um, very good recipe books. Of course, there were quite a few out there, but really good one that comprised all recipes, all sorts of foods that you might possibly want to make or from um, a, meat or in, a meat view that um, if you want to change it to vegetable dishes. So I couldn't find anything, especially um, baking desserts, making which is quite tricky to make without eggs. Um, and a few other ingredients, gelatine and so forth. So I saw a niche in the market to uh, make my own book. And uh, I just love the research, making the food, the photography behind it, the whole creativity. Absolutely loved it. So, and the, and the book just grew and grew to a very, very thick one. Um, so now it's, it's so thick, even I still make use of those for making pastries and, and that sort of thing. Well, that's great. Uh, later on, we'll get um, Lorinda to hold up the book. Uh, uh, she's got a copy sitting down there. But there are some commonalities between making movies and watching movies and making books and, and reading books. And uh, without any further ado, what I'm going to uh, bring up, uh, well, I shouldn't have said that because, in fact, I do have a little bit of further ado to just bring it up. Just one moment, please, and if you can bear with me while I bring this particular PDF up. And, uh, okay, that's it sitting there. Oops, there we are. Just going to share this now, and uh, we've got uh, the questions that we're going to ask Elise about how to watch a movie and uh, the uh, five questions that we've got are about shot and composition, beginnings and endings, editing, mood creation and repetitions. And uh, as we go on and uh, ask um, Elise about what these terms mean, Lorinda will also come in and see uh, whether she can add to that from an author's perspective. So it should be a fascinating two-way conversation between all of you. So um, without any further ado, uh, Elise, we're going to just come over to the very first thing, which is shot and composition. What on earth does that mean, shot and composition? <laughs> Well, I think when we watch a film, 
we tend to see the story. We tend to take in the fact that there's a plot being revealed to us generally via characters. The thing is that we so often don't look at how it's being told to us. And of course, it's being told to us by the camera. And the director is making decisions about how to compose shots and um, and how what sort of composition he's going to use. So I'm going to break that down for you because when we watch a film, it looks so lifelike. Our brain perceives it as real. But actually, everything on screen is being manipulated by a director. So, um, so we need to be aware of how we're being manipulated. If you take shot, for example, um, there's a number of shots that the director can use from long shot, um, medium close up, close up, etc. And each of those shots are going to have a different effect on us. So, if the director wants to make us feel very personally connected, think about the, the limited number of people that you have this sort of a relationship with, that you can really just get that close to, it's very few. And that's a very intimate space. So close-up is going to create a very intimate feeling. Whereas a long shot, that's something that we do all the time. We're always seeing people at full length. And those people don't really mean that much to us. You know, we walk past them in the street. Um, we see them at the end of a corridor. And so the director uses shots like that to make us feel a little bit distanced from the person. So he's choosing the shots and he's cutting between the shots. And if he goes from a long shot to a mid shot, to a medium close up, to a close up, we know He's starting to pick out a particular character out of this range of people that we've seen in long shot. Once he starts bringing that person closer and closer to us, he's identified them as someone that we need to pay attention to. The distance of the shot manipulates us emotionally. Is, yes. is that what you're yes. driving at? Yes, exactly. Yes, it's an emotional manipulation. And then... Once we start getting into what's called an extreme close-up, where you just have a shot on somebody's mouth or on somebody's eyes um, or a detail, you know, their fingertips or something like that, then it starts getting into a whole nother level where um, very often it's a warning. You know, if we see somebody's eyes staring at something, um, that's a cue to us as a viewer watch out. These eyes are going to be signaling um, that we should pay attention to where they're looking. And very often, the director will cut from that extreme close-up of eyes to a long shot, an extreme long shot of what that person is looking at. So the editing, which we're coming to later on, also plays a part. But it's not just the shot, it's the angle of the shot that plays a part. And so um, one of the one of the movies that really brought this home to me was many years ago watching Harrison Ford um, play a cop who went into an Amish community. The movie was called Witness. And he has to take this little boy um, who's witnessed a murder. And you see this little boy before the murder happens in um, a train station. And he's out of his depth. He's used to this tight-knit Amish community where everyone loves him and cares for him. And you see this vast station with these huge statues. And then looking down from sort of behind this statue of an angel, actually, you see this tiny little figure of this little Amish boy with his little black hat. And, and you realize that he's completely intimidated. He's so overwhelmed. And that high, it's a high angle shot. It's, it's designed to communicate to the viewer that this person is vulnerable and weak. And then conversely, you will have a low angle shot making somebody look powerful and strong. Now, I, I think that's really interesting. And I'm just wondering, Lorinda, are there parallels between that that goes on and emotional manipulation? <laughs> what about if you're photographing food? Do you have this? Yes. Yes, I, I can certainly identify with that. Um, so uh, talking about food is, 
in a recipe book, um, most of the shots that I took were fairly close, obviously, but some of them are even so close they just highlight a few of the ingredients on a little platter as well. So sometimes I would take um, food and not photograph it on a full-size dinner plate. If I'm talking about, say, the, the mains, um, the mains meals in a section of the book, because they would be far too big and and the ingredients won't you won't um, really be able to see that. So sometimes I would arrange the food, cut it up a slightly smaller piece, and arrange it on a tiny plate like this, and uh, photograph it with say a dessert um, spoon or a dessert fork. So it looks. Um, to the uh, viewer, if they just page with the book, as though it's a full-size dinner plate, but in fact it was put on a very tiny Japanese plate. And, and then I can get really, really close so that one can see the ingredients in the full color and glossiness. Um, and then sometimes so I go really even closer if I photograph bakery um, items, bread, biscuits, that sort of thing, so that one can see the open crumb, that it is light, and so forth. So. Definitely close-ups is something that I used quite a lot because you want the person to almost salivate as they page through a recipe book and also as though the, the dish is right in front of them, as though they are sitting at a table so that they can identify themselves. Would I be able to make this dish? Does it look delicious? Um, that sort of thing. So, so both of you are involved in the direct manipulation of emotions uh, yes. through through yes. what you call shot and composition. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that's quite quite intriguing. So it's just David, if I could just add that added to the um, to the whole aspect of shot is the camera movement, you know, as unlike a book where it's static, with a film your camera is obviously moving and the um, the fact of whether or not your camera is tracking with a person whether it's static and you see them walking away, or even whether it's a handheld camera and you've got that sort of jerky, jarring motion, is going to have an impact. So um, there's a scene, for instance, in District 9, which is um, a, a movie set in South Africa and it involves aliens called prawns. And they're, you know, everything about them initially is designed to make the viewer feel. Um, a real antipathy towards these aliens. But the use of the handheld camera brings a, an empathy because you get the sadness in this battle scene that the, that the prawns feel, and, um, and you wouldn't get that if your camera was static and, you know, just nice and crisp and clear. So it's, there's a lot of things. You know, there's point of view as well. For instance, in a documentary, you're going to have a very objective point of view. It's a kind of, you know, we're outside third person. We're just showing you what we're seeing. Whereas I'm sure you and many other people would have watched um, the classic sort of suspense type film where it's as if we're in the, the feet or in the body of the victim or the killer, you know, and we're, we're sort of, we can look down and we can see these feet treading on a carpet. And, um, and, and that's the point of view that the, the director has forced us to adopt. So, yeah, there's, there's heat.